the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the wheel, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. As always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce our discussion today, we just want to mention we've got a Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider tossing us a dollarino a month there. If not, maybe leave us an awesome review on iTunes. We'll give you a shout out on the following week's episode if you do. Today, Taylor and I are going to be taking a look at Deleuze's monograph on Nietzsche, Nietzsche and Philosophy. We're going to break this up into two episodes. This first one will be covering the first three chapters, and then next week we plan on finishing the second half of the book. Yeah, it kind of neatly cuts it up into into two pieces. There's some sterner talk in the second half. Be looking forward to that. You're looking forward to the the sterner. This is this is like the the redemptive, the like <laughs> like hey, we got some sterner coming up, so it'll be it'll be worth it. It's. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of the arc we're on, which has been a little bit tortuous, if you will, right? It's kind of we've oh, I've looped, been loving it though. We've looped here and there in terms of Deliz's corpus. And interestingly enough, like you and I, we kind of started with Guattari. That's kind of where we solidified our relationship and then um went through some Freud and some other thinkers and then did, did anti-Oedipus. I guess that was, besides Proust and Science, was that one of the first Deleuze books we did together? Yeah. Right, so we did Proust and Science, anti-Oedipus, and then, you know, anti-Oedipus was kind of sprawled because we were doing, I guess we did a little bit of economy before that. Correct. Yeah, so we did Libidal Economy, Anti-Oedipus, the Baudrillard, right? And now we've kind of looped back around. Just trying to think the order we did. We eventually looped back around to empiricism and subjectivity, Kant's critical philosophy, or is that what it's called? It's Kant and the Critique of Faculties, something like that. Um, the Kant book. And then we did Bergsonism. We obviously had a lot of guests on who had Spinoza. their own books. Right. We did Spinoza Practical Philosophy, the little Spinoza, you know, expressionism. That's a that's a book that honestly probably requires doing at least Spinoza's ethics before tackling into it. So yeah, I mean we've kind of we're kind of saving the the bigger books and by including I'm including bigger books. Oh, we did half of what is philosophy, right, with Vern. So yeah. well, I mean we didn't really focus a lot on that book though, in the dis- actual discussion. We did and we didn't. Yeah, I, I agree. It was kind of a springboard, right? Yeah. Um right. So we're saving the the bigger books, I mean, besides anti Oedipus, which itself is, is pretty fucking big. You know, there's still Logic of Sense, Difference of Repetition, A Thousand Plateaus, the cinema books. We did The Fold, which was cool. And we had Dan Smith on to discuss his his bootleg translation of it. So that was that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, we've kind of we've kind of gone in a untraditional route, if you will, but we're now at Nietzsche and philosophy, which is a book that a lot of people we've talked to started with. I know that Dan and Vern, just since I just mentioned them, coincidentally, they kind of mentioned Nietzsche's Nietzsche and philosophy as their gateway into 
either philosophy or Nietzsche or Deleuze or both or all three, right? So circle back to Nietzsche and philosophy, which is, you know, more or less Deleuze's second full monograph. I think I mentioned an episode a couple weeks ago where I was telling you about one of the books that Deleuze kind of edits and publishes around the Hume book in the fifties is, um, what is ground? You know, it's well, no, that, that was a lecture series. It's just a little book called like Nietzsche. And I think the subtitle is something like, like his life thought and influence or something, but basically he edits kind of a selection of, of Nietzsche. Cause at the time, you know, Nietzsche's getting translated into French kind of um, systematically, you know, Deleuze and Foucault ha are like co-editing the series of new Nietzsche translations. One of the principal translators of which is um, Pierre Klosowski. Dan Smith translated his book on Nietzsche and the Vicious Circle, which is pretty influential for, I don't know if he references it in this book. I'd have to check. But I know that it becomes, you know, a kind of like a touchstone for his. I think Leotard definitely mentions it in Libidinal Economy. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's definitely a book we should take a look at. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. So that was going on around the time or a little bit, maybe a couple of years after he publishes this selection of Nietzsche's translations plus a kind of an intellectual biography that includes like a quote-unquote dictionary of like principal personae or characters in Nietzsche's work and this little Nietzsche bit because he did this something similar for Hume right in the 50s you know he does have empiricism subjectivity which we talked about but he's got a little selection of Nietzsche translations with a kind of introduction if you will and he's got a book on Hume, which is very similar. It's got some translations of Hume and a kind of introduction. These, you know, you wouldn't necessarily call them full books, but they're they're important and they get collected later. Uh, I know they get translated and probably put in, I think at least the Hume part, maybe. I have to check in one of the collections of essays, either Desert Islands or Two Regimes of Madness. But those two pieces on um on Nietzsche and on Hume get collected in pure eminence of life because that was one of the last things he wrote this little essay on on pure eminence or eminence of life and so they kind of add that material to that book to make it chunky enough to to merit being more than a pamphlet if you will it's still pretty slim but yeah, that's one of the interesting things that I recall looking at the other day was there's this like dictionary of characters in Nietzsche, right? So, you know, when, and what is philosophy, which I know we didn't talk about a ton, but when, when Deleuze is talking about conceptual personae, that there are these like characters that kind of dramatize concepts and ideas in philosophy, Nietzsche is one of like, the main people he's thinking of and the translation we're using today by Hugh Tomlinson. I think it'll be in part two. So we can talk about this more then. I just, I'm just anticipating um, Nietzsche goes through these characters, the priest, the man with bad conscience. You could look at Zarathustra and have a whole series of characters, obviously, right? Because of its literary form, even Zarathustra himself could be considered a kind of plastic polymorphic character Dionysus Christ you know these are all these like characters or personae and in, in French it's like one word they just that's the interesting thing right like conceptual personae are also kind of like conceptual characters like in a play uh if you will right yeah. they there's this inevitable literary form to it so for Deleuze Nietzsche thinks that it's very important to like draw out all these these kind of characters in in Nietzsche's entourage that kind of uh, give movement to the concepts that he's creating. 
you know, even just like the ascetic or the, the man who wants truth, if you will, even like woman, like, like beyond good and evil starts with this whole thing. What if truth were a woman? It often like, I'm sure that if we did some kind of Lacanian reading, you know, from seminar 20 or something, there could be some kind of like a Lacanian Nietzsche where, you know, truth with a capital T is like crossed out kind of like the right, law yeah. and law yeah, yeah. is crossed out, right? Like truth does not exist. Woman does not exist. You can imagine that kind of, that kind of move easily being done in any case. Doesn't Badu have some type of, or am I like conflating something with Badu and truth? He makes it, he, he says something similar about, and it's, he's not the first obviously, but you know, for him, you know, I, he would agree with this notion that there's no truth of the capital T that would be either a universal or in, in a, in any sort of banal sense truths would always be produced based on situations and in relation to situations events. and yes the truth as the, the event or something am i am i yes. making that up off the top of my head or right just like is it like events events would be the yeah events would be like the springboard the place from whence to i mean events would be the place for a subject to uh have fidelity towards truths that are not included or a part of the situation it's kind of like you make this decision to be faithful to elaborating the truth of a situation which is like not necessarily included from it which is why it's which is why i think he uses a religious term like fidelity because there's no way of it's kind of it's kind of like the dice throw in a certain way maybe not it's obviously not deliz's dice throw but i think there's something one kind of wagers on elaborating what the situation would have been were one to remain faithful to a truth and elaborate its consequences within the situation right so there's always this you're kind of staking a wager that that which does not exist within the system could be true if one were to if one were, were to take this wagering to the limit i mean that's a kind of bad paraphrasing of some of the elements of like being an event and obviously he he, he elaborates this more and more because he's got now three volumes of being an event at least that's what he's calling it right he's got logics of worlds and uh i guess the eminence of truths or forget what the what being an event three is called but in any case yes you're right it's uh for badu the event is kind of the the site from which well the event has a site from which to elaborate deduce a truth that does not yet in here in the system but could be shown to like in expand not the system but the situation these terms are all obviously like rigorous in Badu's thinking but i mean like i think there's something analogous to to Deleuze, at least, you know, in, in the language that I've, I've brought this up a few times and you, you're probably sensitive to it now. And, and I know that you've pointed it out where we see in this text, at least two or three examples of this kind of notion that, you know, we have the, the sense and value we deserve. We have the thoughts and feelings we deserve based on the sense and value of what we say, et cetera. Right. This, this whole notion of like deserving based on our determination of problems or the values of our mode of, of living and being and thinking, you know, this notion of like merit is, I think, could easily be tied to, to this kind of Bedusian way of thinking, at least analogously. So in any case, obviously we're going to forego, well, I guess we'll be Nietzschean in a certain way by foregoing systematicity because that would just be we could just be like Andy Kaufman reading the book to the crowd reading Nietzschean philosophy like it were what the great Gatsby you know and what stood out to you I mean obviously I could I could start anywhere and I could talk more sort of around around the book with 
context, we could always obviously talk about Nietzsche's life as well. I only try to mention that this is Deleuze's second book. He's This is published in 62. It was one of the first Deleuze books to be translated besides Anti-Oedipus. It was translated, I think, in like 83. So it's kind of early in the Deleuze translation sphere, which is also interesting. But besides that little intellectual foray, and besides the little things I said about the Deleuze, or sorry, the human Nietzsche volumes that were kind of with translations, with little introductions, there's this like 10 year gap or 11 year gap between empiricism and subjectivity and Nietzsche and philosophy that's discussed a little bit like in the uh, in the Das biography. It's almost this. It's not like Deleuze goes quiet. He's still publishing during this time, but it seems like this. This is kind of a decade where Deleuze is really coming into his own. And we can see the last section that we read for today in chapter three is on the is on a new image of thought and on the dogmatic image of thought, which becomes so central to his principal dissertation, a difference of repetition. So like you can see like there's something more ripe or more developed in Deleuze's thought with Nietzschean philosophy. Not that empiricism of subjectivity is like abandoned or forgone or or like forgotten, but empiricism of subjectivity really does seem to come out of a, you know, culminate because of Hume being on the tests for those years. And like he had to study his ass off doing Hume. So it almost seemed to be like, well, fuck, I've, you know, I've, I've had to deal with this guy for a few years. I got all these notes. I got all this stuff. It, it really does seem like that's, that was the occasion for it. But I do think Nietzschean philosophy feels like a, this is a much more Deleuzean text, I would say. Like we really kind of see him coming into his own. That's just my opinion. And that's kind of a meta comment about it. Going through the list of, um, or the, all the monographs you've read, it's, it is cool to see how some of these concepts persist and shift throughout his work. He doesn't use body without organs here, but I found a passage that I think really goes to that notion that oh, I, really? you know, we can go to later. The first thing that I thought might be to discuss, you know, what are values for Nietzsche? Because I think one of the quotes that I, or statement that I have up is, he says, Kant presupposes values. Right. And then we also have what we've been repeating for a while going back to uh, Anti Oedipus was the, what is it, the transvaluation or is the transvaluation of values? Am I? Well, yeah, that, that's that Nietzsche's seems redundant. Phrase. That's Nietzsche's phrase, the transvaluation of all values. That's his phrase. What is your take on what, on Kant presupposing values? You know, that's a great question because it actually segues nicely to the, to one of the last comments I made about how, that last section in chapter three, which was which is actually one of the longest sections on the new image of thought, which we'll see again in difference of repetition specifically, is one of the presuppositions of the dogmatic image of thought, which is much more rigorously elaborated in that book I just mentioned. But one of them is that error is the worst that can happen to thought. Now, Kant didn't actually believe this. Deleuze is kind of cool about this. He's like, you know, in the in the 17th century, error seems to be the um, the enemy of thinking, right? Descartes, I, I have to doubt, I need to doubt everything right. lest I be deceived by some sort of super malevolent force that could like control my my perceptions or whatever appears to me, right? So error seems to be the uh, the impetus for the Cartesian cogito. Right, because for Hegel, it's like error is what kind of propels us forward through history. Right, so you can see how Hegel is able to turn something that's inherently negative for Descartes into the motor of the dialectic. Right. So that makes yeah. that makes perfect sense. And the is in passing that you know for for Hegel, the the enemy of thinking is is alienation. I'm not sure if the aliens would necessarily agree with that because again, they, they might be able to do something dialectical like we just said with error where, but alienation is the spirit, you know, externalizing itself from itself in order to, you know, confront its self, 
and reunite and in, in a higher totality and an alpha bone who knows right, yeah, i mean like christ or like christ or something would be the externalization of the spirit of whatever humanity or something that reconciles Deleuze even gives that christian dialectic or well, i forget what all it's like one part is redemption there's redemption there's blah 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 there's three aspects to it this is good to bring up too and I'll get back to Kant in just a second. So this is a good thing to bring up too, because this is kind of in the early, this is in the first chapter, right? Where he's elaborating the tragic mode of thinking for Nietzsche, tragedy is, is affirmation, joy, rather than a kind of catharsis in yeah. the Aristotelian a sense. Yeah. And one of the things that he points out is, you know, you've got sort of Christ, the martyr for redeeming our sin and therefore rendering the guilt infinite or the debt infinite, which I like that. It, I like that Deleuze points out that, you know, Nietzsche or is it? No, it's not. I'm sorry. In the translation of genealogy of morality, Nietzsche plays off of the, the double meaning of the German word uh, schuld, which is guilt and debt, right? So there's this common source <clears throat> that Nietzsche tries to elaborate how the debt of existence becomes infinite and thereby infinite guilt for the requirement of expiation. We need a savior, an external savior from outside to sort of to save us. Dad to rescue us. Right. And so that's juxtaposed with Dionysus, whose martyrdom or, or dismemberment or sacrifice uh, is not in order to expiate or justify life right it's 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 a process of i forget exactly how Deleuze puts it right but it's it's almost a process of intensifying life i know that's not what he says i'd have to look it up i know it's in our notes it's not a big deal though but there's a difference in the way in which there's not a uh, a rendering of of a sort of debt of existence into an infinite guilt and, 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 and into an infinitude, right? Like Dionysus isn't there to redeem life in a certain way, right? That life is already always already redeemed or something. It of itself is justified. You know, Nietzsche might say aesthetically, at least in the birth of tragedy, that's a theme that kind of runs throughout his, his work, um, which I think becomes important again for sort of the end of chapter three where we stop today where you know art as the power of the false contra plato is a means of intensifying life a means of pushing will to power in this affirmative direction in any case one thing i want to say about kant because you know i i love this moment i think it's h for history of philosophy in the abecedaire the list is like you know 17th century the enemy seemed to be error in the 18th century, the problem with the Kantian turn becomes illusion. So with Descartes, error is this external encounter or this external enemy of thinking, whereas illusion is engendered within reason itself, right? And it's, it's imminent to thinking. So the problem becomes imminent. And of course, Deleuze tries to show in various ways how there's some problems he's pointing to you know uh how Kant doesn't quite solve this etc that's not as important for what you were asking itself which was uh how Kant presupposes values I think that was kind of how you phrased it yeah and so this is why I turned to the uh the new image of thought section I think it's like section 15 or so in chapter three the very last one where this is one of the criterion of the dogmatic image of thought, which is that it presupposes that thinking that thinking wants truth, wants the true necessarily, and that the thinker um, has a good will towards the truth. And so a good will, in my mind, would be, you know, we've got to, um, you know, here he doesn't tackle it's earlier where he talks about illusion, but here he doesn't tackle this question of illusion being internal to thinking, which I think is closer to what Deleuze means when he's thinking about this violence that forces thinking, which he says even Plato in his best times 
actually makes a distinction of right there's this distinction of a kind of a kind of puerile error where i say hello theotetus when theodorus walks by versus an encounter that forces thinking and so he's you know he's trying to think about how philosophy actually begins with an ill will with this this violence without which we would not think and we would remain within stupidity which is a key kind of term in that image of thought chapter and deficit repetition but it's it's interesting right there he talks about stupidity as the word for stupidity he uses in Nietzschean philosophy and deficit repetition is batisse i think i've mentioned this to you it's it's kind of like beastliness or something and Deleuze says in deficit repetition you know you know, stupidity, batisse, is not animality. The animal is kind of protected structurally from stupidity, from batisse. It's really more, for Deleuze, it becomes this problem of, and this is kind of the Apollinean, Dionysian um, complementarity. It's not contradiction, but you know what I'm saying, that, that, that pairing of Ap Apollo and Dionysus, there's a kind of, there's a kind of failure or, or failure in, the, in their struggle because for Deleuze, stupidity is kind of when the ground rises up and kind of swallows up the form. So there's like a failure of individuation. Mm -hmm. He gives examples of, um, you know, one of my favorite things in, in that section is where he says, when ancient poets would make fun of tyrants, it's not enough to reduce the tyrant to an animal. You go all the way to cloaca as this like <laughs> this like digestive ground that sort of is immersed in is shitting where it eats or whatever, and goes goes all the way to like cauliflower and potatoes and and whatnot. It's this kind of so to speak regression way past animality, which is perhaps ironic with this notion of becoming animal, becoming vegetable, becoming whatever in a different sense right because that'll that'll take on positive valences later but in any case right. you know i think that to sort of try to round this out you know kant presupposes and nietzsche kind of points this out himself uh, but kant presupposes that thinking wants truth right that truth is is the ideal is is the goal to strive for in the same way that descartes did even if they have different enemies error versus illusion right but descartes is sort of presupposing for example that there is a not just a goodwill in the thinker but also a goodwill in some divinity that would guarantee the truth of our perceptions god is not a deceiver and you know one of the things and the evil genius that sort of would control our our sense perceptions and therefore deceive us there is this kind of notion of a of an anti-god of a of a deceiving god right but i think descartes chooses this terminology of of evil genius rather than deus deceptor in order to sidestep what would probably come from the church which would be you always had to walk that thin line where the church is going to excommunicate you, is going to censor you, is going to put, you know, mark you with the fucking uh, brand of Cain or something, right? So, you know, that kind of, and we, we know that Descartes not the only one. I mean, there's, um, we talked about this with the Hume book where Hume himself, as radical as he is, is could have perhaps been more radical because even during his day, you know, you've got you've got students in Scotland being hanged for for atheistic, you know, uh, rebellious speech. So, you know, you you got to think about how presupposing the that thinking wants truth and that truth is good and that God guarantees truth in a Cartesian sense. Right. All of these things kind of align with a moral image of thought, a a thought that is upright, it's orthodox. And so I think when Nietzsche kind of traces, as we talked about in our Twilight episode, Twilight of the Idols episode, when Nietzsche kind of traces this, how the true world finally became a fiction, 
and how that's actually a good thing i think for nietzsche and it it articulates the powers of the false you know there's a sense in which i think for nietzsche and deleuze tries to point this out he tries to articulate this that kind of the will to truth in christianity for example in this kind of christian moral image taken to an extreme has to lead to an atheistic thought right the this will to truth has to undermine a belief in god itself sort of undermine itself you know it kind of like caustically eats away its own foundation yeah, and erodes is, itself from this yeah. is super interesting i mean i was going to hint towards death of god which we can talk about in, in a minute if you want but that sure. the death of god would be the natural consequence of the will to truth um okay what the reason this is super interesting to me is because there are two examples that i kind of draw from that make me think that hegel ha is onto something with dialectics and like negation one of them being this no, the way that christianity has become a nihilism or christians have become nihilists and the nihilists have become christian and in this when i say this you know christian is in in quotes on both <laughs> both sides of the equation i guess I, okay let me see if i can like uh if i'm if we're on the same page so sure. so the first part makes sense to me because i think it, it coordinates with what i was saying about nietzsche right where the yeah. will to truth inevitably leads to the downfall right. of the belief in god in order to remain truthful we have to become suspect of this unquestioned belief which is not necessarily founded if you will axiomatically or on some sort of underlying right. truth. it's on faith alone yeah right it's on faith alone as Kant wants to try to preserve faith by limiting reason right that's the title of one of his ah, kind of famous famous uh -huh. books if you if you have you heard of this reason within the limits of religion within the bounds of bare reason or, or reason alone or something like this i had it backwards so yeah my, my apologies so religion within the limits of reason alone right so and it would seem that that the title would be a a bounding a delimitation of religion but in fact it's it's kind of the opposite it's 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 you know you have to make room for faith at a certain point right at a certain point reason has got to like kind of stop asking questions and it's very sim similar to when we had uh, John Pertevi on and we're talking about kind of like the edges of the state where, you know, when Kant's talking about there's a foundational vi violence that sets up states and then there's this like kind of ongoing violence that keeps the institutions and laws functioning. Right. Kant's like, you know, don't look too hard at the foundational violence because if you do, then every state form, every kind of power form begins to look suspect <laughs> there's almost like a kernel of like anarchistic uh yeah, yeah totally realization there it's like if you look a little bit too hard at how there is always and you know and and of course other thinkers have pushed this this thought derrida benjamin they've they've kind of kind of said well like every instituting violence is actually the continuing violence right they're they're, they're actually one and the same even if kant uses two words for the notion of force or violence they're they're etymologically related in Kant. and anyway Kant's kind of like hey if we look too hard at something like i guess religion too if reason pushes too far there's not going to be any room for for faith for for belief and in fact Kant has an interesting term for how we even begin thinking in the chaos of perceptions and and beliefs and ideas he calls it um Reinen Vernu. I got to look at my German's bad. I think it's literally called like the belief of reason. You have to have a kind of rock, a bedrock and almost like an, a, a given. It's like like definitions of mathematics, right? It's like this presupposition. It's yeah. not even an axiom. You can't you have to start with this belief in reason or this rational belief that reason can move forward through the chaos and give consistency to ideas or whatever. You know, I think Deleuze and Guattari are actually pretty close to what philosophy, science, and art are doing with chaos, except that they they don't have to go by way of this 
presupposition of belief. In any case, yeah, in terms of the other side of what you said about Hegel, how the nihilists become Christian or believers, you know, I think if I generalize your term nihilist and think about a certain form of atheism. Uh, and and which, I mean, let me, let me, I yeah. guess this is based on like the appearances, right? What appears to Christians or like what appears to the Christian as the nihilist and what appears as the Christian, the nihilist to the Christian and the nihil and the Christian to the nihilist. Right. In the sense of like the Christian re retains the, their appearance of belief, but that really is expresses itself as nihilism or something like mm -hmm. that. And the ni the perceived nihilism of the atheist, let's say, becomes like moral. It becomes the alleged nihilists become the moral, the people that have the morals or ethics. That just seems to be the sort of case in our contemporary society where like all this weird Christo fascist sort of stuff, you know, disavowing like all of the quote unquote liberal aspects of Christ or whatever. So I see what sense, you mean. Yeah. 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 The Sermon on the Mount becomes libtard propaganda. The meek shall inherit the earth is it's woke speak. Right. Yeah. And this isn't the first time. This is just a new way of, of putting it that like Jesus is woke. This is not the first time that this kind of discourse has gone on. It's just taken on a, a new terminology, this notion that turning the other cheek, a lot of what Jesus kind of preaches in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere, like, uh, you know, just think about how concord, how discordant or how cognitively discordant something like pr prosperity theology is with so much of Jesus sayings. Right. I mean, you could simplify it that way, but yeah. But I mean, I guess it is important to sort of recognize that, you know, Nietzsche points this out, this like nihilism at the heart of Christianity, like way back before our time, obviously. In the genealogy of morality, he looks at someone like Tertullian. I think I, I mentioned this did, guy. Yes. Yeah, you have. And you know, Nietzsche's looking at the the exaltation, the sort of ecstasy of this this idea that there are, are kind of like there's like a glass ceiling to hell or a glass floor to heaven. Yeah, right. So they can um, extract the jouissance of it's almost like you need the the opposite to to be satisfied with your salvation. Like if you don't have the reference point of the non-believer then you can't have i don't know the ecstasy or whatever of of salvation right Which, again, would be like somebody's got to suffer the Hegel range yeah right somebody somebody's got to suffer there needs to be an eye to take a surplus value of those suffering uh in order for the the bliss of salvation to sort of function machinically right. you've got to have this surplus value of of looking on the wretched which is also kind of Hegelian in the sense of like the neg like it's the negative that sort of propels the whole whatever I don't know the total the, the negative is the motor is the engine yeah yeah it is possible yeah I mean it's um you know Nietzsche would would read it less as contradiction and more as like this not saying that Nietzsche actually likes Tertullian he he kind of laughs at him but he likes to think about a kind of a continuum of extremes it's from the extreme of health that i can learn something about illness and it's from the extreme of illness that i can learn something about health and crossing the the divide through convalescence allows me to sort of broaden my perspectives in any case yeah i mean i guess your thing one the last thing about christianity and christians and nihilists you know for nietzsche one of the things that he sees in Christianity, as you mentioned, is a, is a form of nihilism. And that form of nihilism is partly what I was leading to with the death of God, because, you know, yeah, I know that a lot of believers like to think there's the bumper sticker, you know, Nietzsche, God is dead. God, Nietzsche is dead. As though that were some kind of checkmate, checkmate, libtard kind of thing. And Nietzsche's point is not 
that the atheists killed God because of their lack of belief in him. Right. It's that through the adherence to this will to truth, Christianity led to having to get rid of one of its superfluous axioms, so to speak. Interesting. Kind of like in a non-Euclidean way, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's just no more need for this, for a belief in God to. This is why one of the first instances of the death of God, it's not the only one, but it's one of the most famous in the gay science, right? It's a madman. I mean, this is, this is great. This comes back to the, the conceptual persona. Madman enters this church, mm -hmm. you know, raving about God is dead. We have killed him. I think that's the line that they like to forget. The we've believers, killed him yeah the believers have killed him right we you and I, all of us together in, in our in our cult gathering i mean in the broadest sense in our sort of religious subservience we killed him and everybody's kind of looking at him like what the fuck are you talking about dude and he's like i've come too early <laughs> right and nietzsche nietzsche kind of always does this there's it's the untimely it's an untimely thought it takes a long time for um yeah, for this to traverse the unconscious, the body for it for it to reach That's for right. it to reach consciousness. Yeah. yeah. In any case, so what Nietzsche says very early on, pointing this out, is that in Christianity, with this kind of self, this self eroding ground, like a negation, right? It's reactive. This is my thing with the dialectical movement of history: is that then it everything is reaction. I mean, Deleuze himself, and we'll see this in part two, where the Nietzsche contra Hegel aspect is going to get brought out much more strongly, where Nietzsche will become yeah. the anti-dialectical brings... thinker par excellence. Yeah, which yeah. is why he also brings in Stirner, I think, in that section as well. I think so. Because he talks about makes... how Stirner shows that nihilism is at the heart of the dialectic, I think is the specific actual yes. quote yeah. that I've mentioned you know... like 9,000 times. Oh no, no, you're fine. I mean, well, it's been a while, and yeah, it's been you, a haven't long time. <laughs> you haven't mentioned. You mentioned it. A, I think only a handful of times. So maybe you've thought it a bunch of times, but on the podcast, we haven't really talked about it that much. And it's been probably over a year since we even mentioned this passage. So it's good that we'll come to it. But Deleuze himself kind of points out that like it does seem like the way of the world, the way of established values, is nothing but the fomenting of of reaction and yeah. could but you know could if we kind of follow Nietzsche further could there be this a uh, becoming active and how I think he's still elaborating this and only kind of given anticipations in this first mm -hmm. hundred pages but yes I one thing Nietzsche's point about Christianity and the will to truth is that it is also a will to nothingness it is a will to becoming reactive. And his point being is that one would rather will nothingness than not will at all, than to will nothing. So this is still a product of willing and of the will. I think that the contrast to be made here is between Schopenhauerian solution that, that Nietzsche may have at least been enticed by, or at least... Right, yeah. At least Schopenhauer Influence, in general, he was, he was influenced by, but he moves away from when he realizes that, that the sort of the Schopenhauer solution in his own atheism is, and this is the other part that you were talking about, is a kind of belief, if you will. But instead of willing nothingness in this reactive way, it's a different type of reaction where it is to will nothing, to not will, to no longer will. And I know I've talked to you about this a little bit, right? But it's it's this kind of quasi-Buddhistic type of thing where yeah. it's the wheel of desire that keeps us planted on the plane of existence, which is suffering, which is negative and inherently bad, reactive. And it's only by suppressing desire that we can kind of extricate ourselves from the cycle of whether it be rebirth or whatnot, and sort of reach nirvana, it has to be very much kind of like, you know, Freud's nirvana principle when he kind of flirts with this idea of the drive fully eliminating all tension 
and kind of reaching an absolute zero. There's something similar, but much more. I think that's interesting in the context of the number of the number that he doesn't the ludge doesn't say is zero, but like I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it to say that the number would be zero. Which number? The Meyer Man number? Yeah, when he's kind of talking about the when dice he's talking throw. about the dice throw. Yeah, yeah, but that might be skipping ahead too bit too much because I definitely want to get back to like this, like these notions of judgment and good and evil and the tree of knowledge and all of that. I don't know if the number itself in Meyer May it's obviously not zero in Nietzsche, right? The Lewis might say it's the non denumerable multiplicity rhizome, blah blah blah, right? It's it's the kind of the unity of the multiple, what he'll call multiplicity later. You know, he he opposes Nietzsche and Meyer May on the dice throw in, in various ways. And I think that his problem with Meyer May is that even if chance cannot be abolished, it still seems as though chance is related to a kind of calculation of probabilities. And for Deleuze, as, as he kind of points out pretty clearly with Nietzsche, it's like, look, if it were all based on probabilities, either either being would have never become, right? This is the whole Deleuze affirming the becoming of being. This is the eternal return, blah, blah, blah. Or we would have gotten to the to the point where, you know, we would have reached the state where there'd been there'd be like this static thing where all the phases of becoming have been reached. And so there's this yeah. kind of like maximal entropy. If one if one goes by way of probabilities, right? So this, this is the whole, and it's, and it's, he's moving very quickly here in those sections, but this is the whole question of the infinitude of, of time, of past time, blah, blah, blah. In any case, yeah, I mean, I would just say that's, that Schopenhauerian solution, rather will nothing than to will nothingness, right? This is like, it's a different type of pessimism, if you will, because there's pessimism on both sides. It's rather to will nothingness, rather to will the suffering of the unsaved for my own pleasure, rather to will. I mean, the way I take it is, and this is part of the nihilism, rather to will against the creation of new values in order to bolster and protect and reinforce established values than than to not will at all. That's why that's part, that's on the kind of conservative reactive side, which is in the dominant sphere, whether, I mean, we can, obviously we're talking about Christianity here, but we could extend this to whether it be white supremacy, heteronormativity, capitalism, blah, blah, blah. List goes on, right? I mean, like it's, you just insert, insert the powers that be the dominant powers, rather reinforce those, for whether it be the security of a worldview or um or just because of the the anxiety in the face of the creation of values than to not will at all and i think for schopenhauer it's like no we just got to quit the game you know it's the will has to desire its own self-destruction and I think that's why Nietzsche sees in it, it's almost like the truth of Christianity, but from the obverse, from the underside, right? It's, it's Schopenhauer's atheism becomes the other side of, of Christianity, will to truth, et cetera, that it leads in what he calls exhaustion. This is one of the terms that we haven't seen in, in Deleuze's book, but this is a term that we see very much in Human Out to Human and Daybreak, this thesis of exhaustion. Because when we talked about sense and value of phenomena, of actions, you know, when Nietzsche judges Socrates at his trial and he's like, I owe Asclepius a rooster, right? He's like, he's like, I'm, I'm glad it's over. I owe the God of healing like a thank you because li life is this long illness. You know, Nietzsche sees in that kind of a prototype of exhaustion. And we have to ask what 
is the sense of the values attached to to that kind of life that would make that kind of statement, that kind of judgment. What what is the value of the values attached to that kind of statement? What kind of mode of being and living does that indicate? And it indicates a state of exhaustion or, you know, the terms that Deleuze and Nietzsche use, it's leaden, it's, it's heavy, it's, it's base. It's low. I guess that would kind of go back to bestiality, making oneself a beast. Making oneself a beast gets rid of the pain of being a man. That's something from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I think that's true. I think that makes sense. Like a beast to a beast to be put down. Speaking of beasts, here's another character, if you will, another conceptual persona. You know, Nietzsche. Well, some of the animals we see in. And, and there's many of them in Nietzsche, but there's a menagerie, if you will. The list talks about like the bird of prey and the lamb, right? And it's the lamb that's, you know, the bird of prey thinks of itself as good without any opposition. It's just doing what it does. It's force expending itself. There's not like this free will deciding to withhold its rapacious strength in eating the lambs. You know, but it's the lamb who in opposition is saying we're the ones that are good because we we choose not to be like you and to eat other lambs or something or or to eat eat you if we could. And he's just like, yeah, that's the thing. Like, you don't have that power. It's this is the whole of the first essay of gene, the genealogy of morality, the genealogy of good and evil and good and bad. Right. The first type, the type of strength, the active force has good and bad. What's bad is very kind of close to the Spinoza, Spinoza's idea of bad, which is what's bad is what decomposes my forces, right? It's, it's so reactive forces in Nietzsche's sense. What's bad is what separates me from what I can do. And I put I in the first person, but you know what I mean? Like it's what separates forces from what they can do, a body's forces. Evil is something much different. And obviously Spinoza has his own ways of getting rid of evil right because evil is almost like this illusory thing it's kind of a human fiction if you will right because he's having to deal with this problem about kind of a theodicy problem kind of a Leibnizian problem too in a certain way right about how can there be so much evil in this world if if there is this benevolent god behind things which is again this notion of benevolent god i think too is is a part and parcel of the dogmatic image of thought just as there's a benevolent thinker and there is a goodwill in thinking there's a goodwill of the ultimate thinker right of of the divine mind or something mm-hmm. um but, you know evil is something much different you know it's what you know nietzsche might say it's part of slave morality right it's it's evil is that which we are not for the good and bad, bad isn't bad isn't this opposition that that's not what we are. It's just that which is not does not compose with does not allow forces force to go to the limit of what it can do. Right. That's where Deleuze is laying the, the ground for making Nietzsche the anti dialectical thinker is in this first essay right where it's slave morality and he already kind of talked about the dialectic early on in chapter one but he he will come back to this right as we'll see as you mentioned with the sterner stuff and uh it's the dialectic that kind of loses already assimilating in the earliest of the pages to more or less part and parcel of slave morality now I do think that when he first talks about the dialectic in chapter one, and I'll pause for a second and and let you respond, is he's mainly thinking about the Socratic dialectic, the platonic dialogues. But he he doesn't refrain from mentioning Hegel, too, right? Because he talks about the master and slave dialectic as well. So we have to think of both dialectics. You know, Nietzsche himself in the, I think it's Raids of an Untimely Man, and I could be wrong. No, it might be before that. I think it could just be called The Life of Socrates. I got to remember. And Twilight of the Idol is one of the opening passages. You know, he's, he's, he goes pretty hard against the dialectic as this base movement of thinking, right? As though it's in bad faith or bad conscience, even he might say, maybe not bad faith. I don't know. But that's a good quote. It could sum up some of what we've been talking about. 
we make church morality and state the masters or keepers of all hierarchy. We have the hierarchy that we deserve. We who are essentially reactive, we who take the triumphs of reaction for a transformation of action and slaves for new masters. We who only recognize hierarchy back to front. So I was mentioning about stupidity and the tyrant, right? The tyrant with the head of cauliflower or, or potato head and cloaca head. The Liz makes this point that the tyrant is the institutor of a kind of sociality of stupidity and he's the first to submit himself to it and it's you know it's Deleuze goes on right but he assimilates it to to the tyrant is the first slave to this kind of system of stupidity so he's very much thinking of Nietzsche uh, I think and his earlier writing on Nietzschean philosophy when he's talking about Batiste stupidity and um in the image of thought chapter also, it's interesting to note that hierarchy is, um, you know, RK, obviously like principle origin, but also kind of like law. And it's like holy law or holy order, if you will. It's such a common word, I think, that we, that even I at least overlooked or overthought or, or, or didn't see the etymology in it. One of the reasons I even brought any of this up relative to Kant presupposing values goes to Deleuze's interest in Kant's third critique, critique of judgment, because to me, values implies judgment. Who makes the judgment of the values? And also, what by what criterion do we generate value? This is a very... I think um, that there's yeah. like a problem, there's a problematic aspect of this because like, the Christian bad fate or like bad conscious thing tries to put off the judgment onto right. Like it try we try to assuage our judgment, our responsibility to judgment onto God instead of ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, this also goes to this example that I've been discussing about how the market is used at this as a sort of proxy for the same process because it's not. It's not my behavior, my individual behavior that renders someone else, puts them in hell or whatever, right? The slave or the proletariat, et cetera. We collectively perform these judgments through the marketplace, through our choices. The market decides or something, right. right? Yeah, the market decides, but the market is us, right? So it's a similar kind of relationship, which I think goes to this notion of debt and responsibility. I feel like there's some type of parallel there right it's the market is us but us alienated right it's market is is our desires but sort of you know abstracted away from us and reified in a way that that we don't recognize or refuse to to recognize yeah exactly it's like it's we like, think it's that objectively. Oh, it's your fault you have a flaw in your morality that's why you are and your sort of values that's why you you deserve to be at the bottom of the social hierarchy or the like social um, gradient, let's say, because you haven't been pious enough by being an entrepreneur or taking risks or yeah, working hard or, you know what I mean? Forgoing pleasure, et cetera. You haven't lived the aesthetic life, aesthetic life. Yeah, rather, aesthetic where... life, yeah. And now it does have some utility in a certain sense that, what capitalism wants to do, I think, is reward people that don't immediately that don't immediately they let their preference for satisfaction or desire like they're able to hold on to their desire or like negate their desire and invest in the future. Right. Rather than right, take uh, rather right. than like going back to, I guess, the parable of the the two brothers or whatever, like the, what is it? The parables, the son, the prodigal son, the prodigal son, right? So the prodigal son, he wants his inheritance right away. The father gives it to him. He get you know, he like lives it up. He winds up penniless and has to come back to the father. Right. So ironically is trying to avoid this or like encourage this behavior where there's a more long-term thought towards the future rather than like, cashing out my inheritance all now and like enjoying that in the moment 
it's a parable about prodigality versus profligacy and we see that the the outcome of of the the parable is not anything like what we might expect if it were written by the grind set grifters today the prodigal son would be the he grinds it out he he gets he he gets the the happy ending for for that gr- that mindset is he's the one that that sort of wins it all and there's a way in which you know the prodigal son uh parable is a kind of retelling of like jacob and esau right with the kind of the stealing of the birthright and um jacob's running from esau later because esau becomes a becomes a man of war becomes gets a war machine if you will but it ends in a way that again doesn't seem like it would be the natural outcome the natural outcome one might think would be jacob would be what thrown into slavery killed yeah and he it's, broke it's, the law or you subterfuge he used the powers of the false he used the powers of esau's base desires against him what a bowl of soup or something like that right just some you know a natural desire for sustenance use that as a way of um, well, he also dresses up with the furs or whatever to fool him, to fool, is it Isaac? Yeah, he, to fool his blind father. So he's using deception. He's using Which goes powers to Kant, right? Because it's like the only the perception, right? Not the thing in itself. Oh, I thought you were going to say uh, how lying is, is bad in any case, no matter what. <laughs> I know, right, but, a, that is an interesting question with regard to that story, yeah. for sure, right? Right. So, yeah, I mean, so with the prodigal son, right, you know, his complaint seems like the complaint of what we are kind of trained and and raised and acculturated under capitalism, which is like, you know, I I did everything fair. I paid off my student loans. I I grinded and I I worked hard and I denied my uh, I did not. I denied the pleasure principle. I, I cultivated the reality principle. I self-sacrificed, blah, 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 which Nietzsche has a whole, all throughout his work, he's got this whole critique of self-abnegation, the ascetic ideal that that you were talking about. And of course, the father's like, he was lost. He was lost, now he's found. Shouldn't you be happy about your brother? Why are you so obsessed (laughs) with who wins out? Who wins? Right. The way I kind of think about this is in the narrative of Christianity, there is this idea. It's like, well, I was baptized at age 12 or something, and I I did everything the church asked me to, and I I followed all the rules. I didn't sin. I'm good. Shouldn't my reward in heaven be better? Because I think that's the parable is pointing to, right? It's this allegory towards this other world. Why is it that those towards the end of their life, why are we equal? And you could really go into a Lacanian thing about this, about how racism, bigotry, et cetera, is, and Zizek used to be pretty good at this. He's the one that kind of brings it out most clearly, even though Lacan does himself too. There is this root of jealousy, of envy of the other's jouissance. Spinoza's good on this too, right? Where he's like, look, Envy really only works between equals. It's counterintuitive. He he kind of works this out in a way, but he's like, he's like, you know, it's one might think it's it's this thing where it's between unequals. He's really trying to like demystify this kind of thing because it's like I I have an equal right to the same jouissance as this other. Why are they why are they so much closer to the thing? Why are they getting so much more surplus value when I've been grinding away, doing everything you asked? And um, again, it's it, you can think of other parables since we're on this, where like the shepherd who leaves the flock of ninety nine to go after to the save one, the yeah. one. You know, it's this thing where the ninety nine you can imagine. Why are we put at risk? Why aren't we being coddled and and huddled over? We we stayed in the herd right yeah we, we were we were the good ones. ones we paid off our student loans why right. are these other fucks 
but keep in mind we're we're Christians, right? We uh you know, we lead with love or what have you. <laughs> yeah, why are we and forgiving yeah. why are we forgiving debts? Jubilee is a you know, is an anti-capitalist concept, right? Debt forever. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, there's there's a way in which you know, one can hold on to these reactive forces and always want to find some active force to tear down and to keep subjugated. I think this is kind of more about the reality of something like white supremacism or heteronormativity, right? I don't think heterosexuality is going to be threatened anytime soon by the flourishing of other, other forms of sexuality. At least, you know, it's, it's the fact that their presupposed hierarchy, again, we have the hierarchy we deserve based on our reactive forces. We presuppose a certain hierarchy because we remain faithful to an established set of values. Transvaluation would, would ruin my jouissance because I'm, I adhere to, to heteronormativity, to, to whiteness, to blah, blah, blah. I say the 14 words. Why should I give up my privileged place, my hierarchical position? Why should equality be enshrined in law? Shouldn't shouldn't other people have to grind to get their recognition? Because again, it, this is the Liz's thing too. Going back to you know, will to power is not about gaining power and therefore thereby gaining representation, thereby gaining recognition. Mm -hmm. This is the critique of the the master, master and slave system. dialectic going by way of of recognition mm -hmm. rather than. I think with Nietzsche and the way that he retells the story in the genealogy of morality is it goes by way of language. I think this is where Deleuze and Guattari kind of push this further with, um, with order words in the postulates of linguistics, right? Where language, language gives command, life obeys, right? Like this is the kind of Nietzschean underpinning of something like order words. But I, I'll leave that for another time. You know, we're... Um, so yeah, we have the hierarchy deserve based on the reactive forces that we cultivate, based on the renunciation and you know warding off of the creation of new values, the transvaluation of values. Not just that we don't have to participate in them, but there's a certain sense we we see in reactive reactionary conservative discourse, it's the fight against new values. It's not just the propping up of established ones. Although that's part and parcel of it, but it's but the polemical edge is to use the propping up of supposed truths of various images of thought. For example, someone, a friend of mine, um, told me about this great little phrasing like bioessentialist realism. And you can put realism in scare quotes, at least in my head, I do. There's two genders. This kind of presupposed image of thought, no matter how much biology is in, in its scientific rigor, undermines this thoroughly. But you know, it, you can imagine something like Derridian deconstruction. It's like, well, I don't want to deconstruct binaries. I'm happy with the binaries of metaphysics. I'm happy with my my binaries. I want to keep those established, deconstructing them ruins my worldview, my investments, my sanity and security in, in an established world, in a quote unquote functioning society. I saw that the other day, someone saying like, you know, equating capitalism with a functioning society versus something like anarchism or something like this, which obviously has its own issues and discourse. And we could, we've talked about that before, but thinking of capitalism as a functioning society is, is itself a kind of saying this unironically is, you know, for whom is it functioning and for what, for what is it functioning? That has a whole presupposed value judgment. Now this didn't really get to your point about Kant and the critique of judgment. And I do think that that would be a longer discussion specifically about what the form of judgment is in philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, because for Deleuze, he'll want to, you know, he kind of follows our toe in this, this to have done with the judgment of God, where judgments taken in a very concrete, particular sense have to be superseded by something else. 
but I think that's a whole other discussion that we can have at some point. You know, I am glad do. that you brought, yeah. bring up Derrida and deconstruction because I was. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's notion. obviously it's obviously not like foreign to it, and I don't know if without thinkers like Hegel, Heidegger, Nietzsche, obviously Plato, I'm not sure if the di uh, if deconstruction would be possible or if it would have the motor, the engine that it does. Those are some of Derrida's principal interlocutors and thinkers, which is why I think uh, Gatry Spivak spends almost 100 pages sort of going through, giving us a kind of crash course in the history of metaphysics so that we can kind of follow some of what Derrida is doing. In terms of the dialectic, I think what Derrida tries to make clear, and it, obviously, Hegelians, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you're going to like say Hegel already does this, sure. I, I'm sure, I'm sure he does. So I'm not <laughs> saying Hegel doesn't, but Derrida's point with, um, you know, deconstructing binary hierarchies is, I mean, again, very simply, very paraphrasing, but, you know, we can take any binary opposition and it's never a, even though it's an opposition, it's never a kind of equal opposition. There's something I like to think about, and I'm not even sure if this is Derrida's terms or if this is more Derridian terminology, but there's like a hinge where the emphasis or the value of one starts to topple the binary so that it's uneven. And we can, we can keep doing this kind of hinging, this kind of topsy-turviness of upending the binary to the point where it, it goes ass over tea kettle. I mean, again, I'm using kind of, I'm not even going into conceptual terms. I'm just kind of like thinking about this in a almost imagistic way, but sure. you know, one, one can think of speech and writing is the one that he really focuses on. You know, we can think of the way in which, for example, Plato, and this is one of the, just, it's just great how solidified it is, but you know, in Plato with Socrates, Socrates is kind of wary of, the written word writing is dead speech right writing cannot summon the author the the author of the speech to defend the words whereas a living breathing interlocutor can always back up speech with more speech it's alive it's flowing yada 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 right so you know Socrates is the one who does not write. Plato is the one who does not speak. There's already a kind of puppetry going on, uh, which is shown in a lot of like medieval art. You know, Plato's like the puppeteer behind Socrates. And you can kind of like see how, um, you know, you, you even see something like an anti-Oedipus where they do bring up Derrida to make this point that if the primitive mode, uh, the primitive territorial machine its principal mode of functioning is to mark and inscribe bodies then one can say that writing in fact or sorry that speech in fact presupposes writing right that writing is is primordial this is their own way of kind of deconstructing the binary because it's always assumed that orality and speech is primary in language and linguistic terms so again you can kind of see how the hinge goes back and forth and there can be ways in which all of the negativity ascribed to writing, as I said, through Plato with like, it's dead speech. This is a way of giving the binary speech has the upper hand, but one can, and you don't even have to be rigorous about it. You can just be like, well, you know, memory fades, writing can help immortalize it and keep it alive. If in a rigorous fixed form, one could also think that writing can also fade, but you know, there are ways in which, so again, I mean, like, obviously I'm not being rigorous about it, but yes, I think this is kind of uh, how Derrida takes the dialectic and is able to frame it in such a way that it's not just kind of the movement of spirit through history or something like this, where it can actually be a rigorous practiced form, that it can be a kind of dialectic put into practice that can be be taken and and intensified and not necessarily 
done in such an abstract way. I mean, there's a way in which, as we talked with Stephen Holgate, the beginning of the law of the, of the science of logic, right? Where you start with being and nothingness and they immediately vanish into their opposite. There's something a little bit more subtle with what Derrida is trying to do and trying to show how any sort of binary hierarchy is, is inherently unstable because of various reasons that aren't just about this sort of abstract movement of opposition. There's something more dynamic than sheer opposition insofar as there's always a, these kind of hidden presuppositions, value judgments, as, as we were just talking about. There's a kind of valuation in Plato of speech overriding. And so why is that? And, how, and, and, is, and does that make sense? And what, what sort of value judgments a series of value judgments does that presuppose in this initial binary? And so I think that in that sense, deconstruction, while definitely taking on methods of the dialectic, is asking different questions and forming different problems. Now, again, Hegel would be like, well, Hegel does this. Sure. I think he does. But Hegel has his own formal method. Mm -hmm. And he's got his own kind of teleological unfolding and i mean teleological in a very neutral sense not in a negative sense we talked with stephen holgate about how the teleology isn't presupposed right it kind of kind of comes at the end paradoxically which is so like i mean doesn't I'm trying to be of... fair to hegel i'm trying to be fair to hegel like as much as i am not a fan right. and not in the same sense as to lose more of the writing i've already said this than than really the thinking but go ahead oh, i was just gonna say doesn't that kind of i mean Maybe I'm just revealing my own ignorance, but it kind of reminds me of like in the last instance, sort of like a, like a radical eminence almost. You mean the telos? Yeah. Coming at the end rather than at the beginning? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it just uh, it just depends, right? Like last instance, you know, in the in the Hegelian Marxist sense, I think is still kind of quasi mystical. And I know that that's laughable coming from like... <laughs> you know, in opposition to say Laura well, um, because a lot of people, uh, Badu has written them off as mystic. I know we talked to Ben Woodard about that, right? Right. Like that yeah. was his, I can see how someone like Badu would say that, but, um, you know, for Laura well, I don't think the telos of Hegel being at the end rather than at the beginning would make it radically imminent. If it were radically imminent, it would be before the beginning, paradoxically, rather than at the end. To bring this back, how does that relate to the dice throw? Because the dice throw to me, although I guess maybe it does in a way come at the beginning because it's already within the everything's within the die already. Or within the will before it's, it's within cast. the will that affirms, not the die. It's the will that affirms the whole of chance. Does that make sense? You don't you don't affirm the whole of chance after you've won your dice throw. That's kind of rigging the game. That's being a bad winner. Gotcha. Okay. You see what I mean? I like you don't, I, yeah. You don't I, throw I the dice was... and then win and say like, "Hey, I affirm that." That's not how. <laughs> you know, it's. Um, I think it's the same with Lula saying not to be unworthy of what happens to us, right? If there is an ethics of the event, it's you don't have like good things happen to you and say, "Yeah, I affirm those events." You know what I mean? Like that's not right. That would just be. I guess I was thinking more along the lines of like, let's say think about how to explain this so i was thinking about this kind of in the sense of actual virtual and mm -hmm. contingency being the universality or the universal in the sense of like the outcome of the dice being thrown is not decided until they're it's not predetermined right but it in a way it almost is due to contingency because if everything is contingent upon everything else in terms of outcome, then there is a sort of deterministic aspect to the dice throw. But it's like that role of the dice only exists in this, I don't know, I want to say timeline or universe, right? There's another universe where the dice rolled in a different combination, let's say. But in this universe... And that's where imminence is, isn't that like everything in the universe is imminent to one another? It's not predetermined, but it is determined in the sense of contingency. 
if that makes sense. Like that's a weird contradiction. <laughs> Am I making any? I, I would say instead of predetermined, you're, you're, I would say instead of contingency being predetermined, it's, it's affirmed. Insofar as contingency is affirmed and therefore the whole of chance is affirmed, then the outcomes are predetermined only in the sense in which we are no longer judging the affirmation based on the probabilistic outcomes. The dice themselves are not loaded in terms of their outcomes. They're loaded in terms of their affirmation of contingency. And that's, I think, what you meant by contingency being predetermining it. It's a weird pre... Uh, maybe, yeah, predetermined is probably a loaded term to kind of pun on your loaded dice <laughs> notion. That I don't know. This is kind of the way that I think of in the last instance, because it's a weird, contradictory way that all the possibilities are there. They can only be expressed in one way in the universe at a time. Not every role is possible either. I don't, I don't know. You can't roll a seven and a one at the same time, right? You have, like, you can only have one outcome of the roll of dice. You don't have multiple. You're not affirming any one outcome. It's in one roll. But that, see, I had the, the that that, that what the is affirmed have... is is the repetition taken to the nth power of the rolls, yeah, right? I so mean, it's I know not about that's... any one outcome. Yeah, I mean, I know that's De... that's what Deleuze says, but I feel like the dice have to be rolled before you can make a judgment. And who's making the judgment? And by what criterion are they making the judgment? And why would you affirm horror? Why would but you I affirm think... a world of suffering and death? Aren't you basing this on the bet? On the wager itself, you're wagering on a good outcome. And I, I mean, feel it, like it, we're sort of caught up in the, we don't have a will. The casting of the dice is out of our hands, at least on the, at the individual level or something. Insofar as, yes, but we still will actively, affirmatively or not. We can be bad players of the game. We can be reactive, resentful dice throwers. And we can cry that the dice are, are loaded, that Einstein, God doesn't play at dice. One can imagine a kind of evil Einstein where God loads the dice. Yeah. God plays dice, but he cheats. And that would be the kind of resentful way of, of denying chance. Or of affirming bad chance, affirming chance badly. I'm only going to affirm the throws that go my way. I'm going to blame someone else for when the throws go badly. That's being the bad dice player. This still bothers me in terms of like an ethic because it reminds me of the ethics of the marketplace where you like wagered on something and you lost. That's you have to so sad, you know. Everything is a gamble relative to the marketplace. Starting a business, um, investing in your education, for example, right? So you take out, you take out a student loan, and and you wager on yourself by taking out a student loan. Perform whatever action. You roll the dice. You lose. It's your fault that you that you lost, and you have to affirm the <laughs> the fact that you lost. But you invested in yourself. I don't know. That's this is where I just have a problem with this kind of like. But even, even blaming yourself is is a, that's just taking resentment to the next degree, which is bad conscience. Where now we as egos are rolling the dice, and we have to take on the guilt of how the the dice roll, right? So it comes comes back down to like the main point being assigning blame. Now I'm not assigning blame to others for, for cheating or for right. rigging the game. Now I'm blaming myself for, for not cheating. Cause if yeah. you're not cheating, you're not trying or some shit. Right. right. Yeah. And I just, I just don't know that, that that works either. I mean, it especially doesn't work for Nietzsche. It may work within a, a sort of capitalistic morality, a morality of the marketplace, but I don't think that that works where, you know, reducing, an enterprise like a business endeavor to 
the main form of the dice throw seems to already rig the kind of conceptual game that we're we're trying to play because i don't think the marketplace is is necessarily the best example of affirming the whole of chance i don't think that's what the marketplace is right it's that kind of game is already probabilistically predetermined and hierarchized in ways that are reactive it's already built on yeah. a whole i mean i see it as mindset. like a game of musical chairs that's assuming that like the the chairs are, are always going to slide from under your ass it's much more in the sense in which instead of probability i almost think about if we're going to use market terms mm -hmm. like the event is sort of unforeseeable it's an encounter so it would be more like a black swan or something right where this is not when we are affirming the whole of chance we are not saying within the rules and laws of probabilities and statistics i affirm the whole no i, I don't think that i don't think it works like that right like probability and statistics actually starts to bring in some of the problems of the possible that we talked about with Burke's song where it seemed it's kind of this negative image of the real well, really, we're, when you were asking about the virtual, I do think that that's much more, again, to use the, the marketplace language, that's more of this, this question of black swans, right? It's, it's, it's not accountable by the system of probabilities and statistics. That's more of the domain of the actual, and you could say then the possible in a restricted sense, but not, not necessarily the virtual. That could be a whole another discussion, and we can, I'm sure, maybe come back to this in part two as we read more i wouldn't mind coming back to this i mean i may cut this out but just to think about i think maybe muadib and uh, messiah kind of plays with a lot of this in the sense mm -hmm. of like and he does use probability as this way to negotiate the future and his wager but even his probability is not complete there are variations within the actual expression of the future. He doesn't see everything, but he is sort of, due to contingency, he is locked into a certain outcome in a sense. Like, And I do think yeah. maybe he does have a bad faith towards his own responsibility for where he is and Cheney's fate or something like that, but. I think Herbert is kind of dealing with a little bit of what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I kind of think so. You know, it's just that from Paul's semi-limited, obviously it's much more expanded than in various, various ways, not just by being whether Kwisatz Haderach or, or the father of Kwisatz Haderach, whichever one you want to look at it, you know, by being closer to this singularity Mm -hmm. And by having the mintant trading, right, and these other forms of training, he's able to sort of pierce the veil of past, present, and future in ways not seen until his son, the only one that surpasses him, so to speak. I think the way that her, the language Herbert has to use in terms of, especially if you consider Paul's mintant trading, is probabilities, is calculating probabilities, yeah, chain absolutely. reactions. 100%, yeah. And I think that that's fair, and that makes and that makes sense within the within that that fictional world. That makes a lot of sense, which is obviously um, reductive, but you know, just for our purposes. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I, I am being reductive. You're right. Oh no, um, I, I'm just saying, like, obviously, this the narrative of the story, right? Like, it's you know, we're crunching down our variables, right? And so, what Paul's dilemma is is to choose the. The best dice throw. Right. Yeah, exactly. And to become faithful to that dice throw and to follow it through to its consequences. Okay. I like that. Yeah. And I think sense. that I think that in that sense, in a limited sense, within Herbert's framework, we could go far enough to say he does affirm the whole of chance. Because the whole of chance, as you said, in, involves sacrificing Chani. And also right. his own credibility as a messiah or god, right? Like, right. He has to discredit himself to end the sort of the religion, his own worship. The cycle of violence and retribution. Yeah, and that... he has to discredit himself in a way that doesn't martyr, that excludes martyrdom, because that's a threat to the sustenance of 
the that would keep the cycle the, going exactly yeah right so he has to he can't be a a christ messiah he has to be dionysus he's gotta affirm the fact that his death is not this like hidden meaning meaning that's esoterically to be revealed as as salvific right as as saving so i do think that there is at least the hint of affirming the whole of chance in um in herbert's dune through paul you know and his struggle is the fact that when we affirm the whole of chance we don't have this this type of prescience right right we don't have this this vast computer brain probabilistic even if our our brains sort of already naturally do this in a limited very limited way comparatively yeah, right yeah, to right. to paul exactly. yeah we're projecting mm -hmm. out yeah in a sense a lot of that is is more imaginary but not to say that that's just a false image it's just part of what we do is we sort of make these plans and you know obviously god laughs at the plans of men blah 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 right but that's part of it right that's part of affirming chance right it's you know obviously there's a probability that some will not rise tomorrow there is this probability that we'll die in our sleep whatever and yet we like continue on i do think that like there's a there's a kind of you know you can see that they're they're at least like some of the half truths or kernels of truth in like absurdist philosophy and literature kind of comes to this mm -hmm. i think more aptly expressed in sartre than in camus but even in camus right in something like the plague there is this meaninglessness and in a certain way there's always been meaninglessness but we we've we've always dressed it up we've always dressed up this black hole of meaninglessness with established values and we look to them to kind of guide our way and our path and what happens when those aren't there for us when we actually do we are faced with the abyss you know we have to look into the abyss and draw from that black hole to create we can easily collapse it into it it's faced with that with that condemned to be free shit that sart always talks about right that's when we have to recognize that we are and this is sart's language not nietzsche's but we are kind of responsible for our freedom right we're responsible for sort of affirming our freedom otherwise we're in bad faith which you know we sort of always partly are and i think that's part of sars thing like hey you can't fully escape bad faith that's just a part of the dialectic of transcendence and facticity blah 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 but i mean i think with nietzsche too like hey it would be great if we could just become an active and like become who we are and that's and, and be like hey i landed i'm good there's always going to be reactive forces seeping in, in our thinking, in our being, in our feeling. There's always going to be sort of little micro fascist fragments like invading our desire, right? This is just part and parcel of whether you could say being human, whether you could say thinking, right? The process of thinking. There's a way in which thinking is not thinking because it's not forced to think it just kind of relies on a it, it slips back into habit which again is not 100 percent negative whether it be in hume or um or bergson right that's just a part of our of our little the little individuations we we sort of go through so i mean i think that all of the what we've talked about you know, because one of the quotes we, we should maybe start to close on is that kind of famous quote that Deleuze has where people ask, what's the use of philosophy? We have to be like firm. We have to be aggressive because usually they're going to say it in this ironic and sort of cost, caustic, mordant tone, sarcastic tone. There, there have been philosophers. Schelling is one of them. He's not the only one. There have been many philosophers who praise the uselessness of philosophy. And I think that's something that Deleuze himself fights back against throughout his work. Even, even at one of the very last works, What is Philosophy? He's like, look, 
people don't take seriously anymore this answer that philosophy is useless. It's a kind of tired, trite, stereotypical answer and a kind of an excuse for, again, not creating new values, et cetera. But he's saying, look, philosophy is good for something. It's good for harming stupidity. It's good for saddening, saddening those who would defend established values. It's good for harming their stupidity. And Nietzsche himself directly says this in the gay science. It's like section 328. I was reading this earlier. The fucking title of it is to harm stupidity. Deleuze is taking this language straight from Nietzsche about one of philosophy's principal roles is not to just be content with the hierarchies we supposedly deserve, you know, or to recognize the hierarchies we deserve. This, this refrain that he has of, we have the feelings and thoughts that we deserve. We have the hierarchies we deserve. We have the solutions we deserve based on how we determine a problem. Not to be content with what we deserve is pre-given. I kind of see that as part and parcel of, of the harming stupidity. Not to be content with, with these ready-made, this is what you get, this is what you deserve. I think that's where we can really start to become resentful and bad conscience and ascetic. Well, I don't deserve anything, right? I don't deserve to enjoy or, or I, don't, I don't deserve to, at the very end of the day, live. And it doesn't have to be a directly suicidal thing, but I mean, it could be like, I have to grind set. I got to get this bag, this money. And that, that becomes the justification for doing a routine that is never called into question, right? So there's a, there's a sense in which I see Deleuze going to Nietzsche, this question of transvaluation of values that you were talking about. It is this difficult movement of calling things into question in ways that lead to having to be creative, not just in, in, in solutions of, of old problems, but in the determination of new problems and in the redetermination of, of old problems, right? Like that's, I think, where Deleuze thinks that, that learning occurs, which he wants to oppose to like something like absolute knowledge at the end of a Hegelian dialectic. I do think that there are some Hegelians, I'm thinking of Gabriel Catrin, who kind of sees the movement of absolute spirit and absolute knowledge as something akin to like Deleuzean learning. But for Deleuze, knowledge, and, and Nietzsche is very wary of knowledge too. Knowledge is not the goal. Knowledge should only be a means towards the ends of like intensifying and augmenting life, you know, not, not just something to be attained and, and like held on to. There's... Like a you miser would, yeah, like a miser would hold on to their knowledge or whatever, hoarding of knowledge for its own sake. The fantasy of, whether it be the fantasy of, of one equation to explain the physical universe, or even if we were to grasp that, right? Like, even if we were to get that, even if that were possible, what are the uses to be made of that? And so in that sense, I think it, it kind of goes back to the 11th thesis on Feuerbach, you know, Marx. It's not about interpreting the world. It's about transforming it. Well, I think for Nietzsche and what Deleuze is trying to show with Nietzsche, although next time I'll talk a little bit about interpretation and why Deleuze moves away from that with Guattari, probably because of Guattari. But, you know, as we saw, the philosopher is a, is a symptomatologist, right? And so like... He's interpreting phenomena based on their, their sense and their value, right? Like, what are the values implied by the will to truth, which is something we talked about today, right? So interpretation, I think for Deleuze, is a part and parcel of transformation. And I'm not sure that Marx really just really would be opposed to that. I think that for the most part, he's saying philosophers have merely interpreted, right? It's you got to do something with those interpretations. You right, got to, yeah. you got to use it to transform. Right. Yeah, exactly. Instead of just right accruing them for their own sake or whatever, yeah. like little jouissance you get from that. I mean, Deleuze, circle jerk yeah. is kind of the whole circle jerk. Well, a circle jerk is, is, is a funny way of saying it. Yeah. I mean, like Deleuze, and this could go against like Hegel with his little logic, the encyclopedia logic, you know, for Deleuze, 
there's three types of philosophy, right? I mean, he wants the middle path, which is kind of a, um, a pedagogy of the concept, which is a continue again, and I think he means it in, in, in the sense in which I just outlined learning. It's this perpetual process of learning, of redetermining problems in order to transform our possibilities of thinking and, and feeling and, and solving them. But there is like, you know, on one side, there's like, let me look this up and I'll, I'll let you end. He calls it, so he says, the post-Kantians concentrated on a universal encyclopedia of the concept. This is what I was just, we were talking about, right? This sort of accumulation of knowledge for knowledge's sake that attributed concept creation to a pure subjectivity rather than taking on the more modest task of a pedagogy of the concept, which would have to analyze the conditions of creation as factors of always singular moment. The other part is commercial professional training of the concept, right? The businessmen are the one who make concepts. He says, if the three ages of the concept are the encyclopedia, pedagogy, and commercial professional training, only the second can safeguard us from falling from the heights of the first into the disaster of the third, an absolute disaster for thought, where whatever its benefits might be, of course, from the viewpoint of universal capitalism. So that's how the intro to what is philosophy ends. But yeah, he's concept creation in the sense of like marketing and Mad Men, I think it's kind of like what I think of when he talks about that. Incidentally, on the back of the physical copy of uh, The Inhuman that I bought, which is Leotard's book, he yeah. calls himself a symptomatologist on the back of that. There you go. Yeah. What I wanted to wrap up on, I wanted to for sure at least get this in before we close out because I thought this was just a banger quote and I thought it was a pretty cool, like, this is where I kind of see maybe like the gestational form of the body without organs as a concept. So I'm going to mm -hmm. go ahead and read this. Any two forces being unequal constitute a body as soon as they enter into a relationship. This is why the body is always the fruit of chance in the Nietzschean sense and appears as the most astonishing thing, much more astonishing in fact than consciousness and spirit. But chance, the relation of force with force, is also the essence of force. The birth of a living body is not therefore surprising since every body is living being the arbitrary product of the forces of which it is composed. Being composed of a plurality of irreducible forces, the body is a multiple phenomenon. Its unity is that of a multiple phenomenon, a unity of domination. It's interesting, right? Because I would have to look at the French to see if the words... Not that it matters so much. If the words that Nietzsche or Deleuze is using there is unity or or un, he could be playing off the one and the multiple, which is like, you know, part of the like platonic and post-platonic dialectic. But the one thing that we we would have to add to body without organs, everything there is great, especially with the forces and all that shit. Yeah. And it would be this undermining of unity that would be where the next step because i think that's where and that's why I, I mentioned in my little twitter thread a week ago or so and i don't really blame hugh tomlinson for this this could have been he was in dialogue with the Liz when translating this the Liz could have, could have could have put this forward to change his noun of multiple to multiplicity but i i said it, it was kind of a disservice because the Liz has not yet formulated the notion of multiplicity he first kind of really talks about it in brief, in the Bergsonism book, which we talked about, right? Riemannian manifolds and all that, right? This is kind of Bergson's French literalization of manifold. And obviously, by A Thousand Plateaus, multiplicity becomes this its own kind of concept. And it kind of gets another name that's strongly related to it or that, that ramifies it, which is rhizome. I think that if we think about the unity of domination that that passage ends with of yeah, dominating was, and dom dominating. That's the forces. one thing I was confused about. Was if we can that. think about that unity as a provisional unity, as an arbitrary one in the sense of the passage that you just read, yeah. if we can emphasize that, that it's a provisional unity that, as they say with about the body of other organs and, and anti Oedipus, right. That's non totalizing that exists alongside the parts. <laughs> and right. yeah. Then, then I, then I think that we get closer to the BWO, like you yeah. said, 
we get closer to the body without organs because the body without organs is not opposed to the organs it's opposed to the the organization, organization right so there's something about that where if the provisional status and the arbitrary status which are two key words in that passage if those are um are emphasized then i do think we have something of a way of parsing body without organs you know there may be some other modifications to do as i said multiplicity rhizome but you blah, can, blah, i mean blah. you can kind of see like he's thinking this early on he's like thinking you can kind of see the gestational aspect you can it. you can see the seeds of it yeah right. right yeah really the first half of the sentence that you just read you know it finishes with this unity of domination but the first half is being composed of a plurality of irreducible forces the right. body is a multiple phenomenon yeah yeah and that's the part i thought really that i didn't know what to make of the second half <laughs> yeah a multiple phenomenon its unity is that of a multiple phenomenon a unity of domination right the multifacetedness of a body based on its forces be right because and this seems maybe almost too silly to even mention but as the list says like you can apologize to nick for me because i know he's a star wars fan but like to speak of the force <laughs> in the right. singular is um you know it doesn't really make much sense and i think that that part of this the reason why the list says this is also because he kind of points out that to speak of the will in the singular is also kind of a misnomer. Even though will to power is often singularized. Yeah. You know, to speak of the will in the sense in which Schelling or Schopenhauer kind of generally speak of it as this kind of like primordial mystical force, but like for Schopenhauer behind representation, right? Representation is almost like that external covering of the will in this almost like cosmic universal sense yeah okay that's interesting you know it, 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 it it's the same problem with language when we speak about for example uh becoming in a singular sense as though it were one thing which is why i do like in, in a thousand plateaus when they will pluralize devonir when they will say you know becoming's animal becoming's woman and, and things like this right even if the singular comes back it, it's clear right that almost makes me wonder if we should look at the world as will and representation <laughs> yeah it's interesting and finish the second half of this book but i, don't I mean know. It, it's an interesting book you know and i've always had an interest in schopenhauer i uh especially because of my interest in nietzsche it's something that we can obviously keep keep afloat as a possibility even volume one i think is probably close to 400 pages and volume two usually isn't read as as often, although it's got some interesting parts too. I have to look at Schopenhauer's stuff. He's got some other stuff like um, Pererga and Paralopomena, these like assorted essays. It's a fancy little Greek way of saying bits and pieces or some shit. He's also got an earlier book that's perhaps not as well known well it's not as well known as well as in will it's um i think it's like the fourfold root of reason so yeah if we did want to do some schopenhauer i would not be opposed let me see the f yeah the fourfold root of reason may or may not have been his dissertation I, I i can't remember i'd have to look on the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason is like the, the long form title so I'm not saying we read that instead. I was just thinking about some of his his more famous works. I think we can we can end here and return to mm -hmm. Nietzschean philosophy part two next week. So that'll wrap up this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. The very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity. Including the ultimate form of security, which is unconscious. The whole state of things, the flow of violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real. The vanishing point of reality. 
let's not have a misunderstanding here.